In this video, I'm reacting to season one of the HBO series Westworld and offering some theories about how it uses architecture to advance the story, as well as offer up some theories and some examples of buildings that the show relates to. So stay tuned to the end for my punch list of items where I offer my thoughts for how the show could engage architecture even a little bit more thoughtfully. Let's get into it. There's nothing to be afraid of, Dolores as long as you answer my questions correctly. Westworld is a science fiction show on HBO whose premise comes from a series of films written and directed by Michael Crichton in the 1970s. The show involves a theme park where robotic hosts are indistinguishable from real human visitors. You want to ask, so ask. Are you real? And the hosts' jobs are to usher the visitors through experiences in a simulated world themed around various unique settings in place and in time. Science fiction is a genre that's about world making as much as it is about advancing a plot or developing a character. And this often means that the setting itself can actually take center stage as characters explore the unfamiliar worlds. Sometimes architects are even brought into the production team to help envision these future worlds, which is true for Westworld where architects like Bjarke Ingels served as an informal consultant. Now, the first time I played at Whitehead, Family was here, we went fishing, did the gold hunt in the mountains. And last time? Came alone, went straight evil. It's the best two weeks of my life. So we're introduced to Westworld by train, and the train seems to be an important element running throughout the show. The invention of trains absolutely shattered our perception of space when originally introduced to the public. They truly were the first stab into puncturing the boundary between the town and the countryside. With trains, the world got much smaller all of a sudden. For the first time, we as humans were able to move at speeds that were out of sync with the human body and the human form. And people could move so quickly between locations on the globe that the lack of time standards became a problem. So not only did they challenge our perception of space, but also as time as well. Train cars are kind of like moving living rooms or waiting rooms with windows that frame the landscape in a moving picture show as the landscape whizzes by. Inside of a train car, we are really disconnected from the landscape beyond. In a sense, we only maintain a visual relationship with the outside landscape. The space of the train car is like its own separate reality, separate from the reality outside, and it has its own disconnected pace of time and motion. Of course, this is like a running theme inside of the show at large. The idea of the theme park is that it's like an entirely enclosed world that's separate from the reality outside, where the traditional rules and laws no longer apply. A place to be free to stake out our dreams. A place with unlimited possibilities. Here we are arriving in the heart of Westworld in a town called Sweetwater. The disorienting, disconnected world of the train car interior is allowed to slow down and, and stop and allowed to reconnect with the landscape that it had been severed from in the previously. People land in a new place and they're able to reset their identity and decide who they want to be. The town itself seems almost temporary, or like it could have been placed anywhere. There are no permanent or lasting man-made landmarks. And streets are just the distances between buildings. There's no concrete or anything defining the ground as distinct from any other patch of ground. The civilization feels like it hasn't really taken a hold yet 100%. The regulating laws and the things that govern how we're supposed to engage the built environment haven't been completely established here in Westworld or in Sweetwater. And I think the lawlessness of the place can be read just in the architecture and in the kind of urbanism or the urban strategy of the town. In this scene, we can really understand the scope of the simulation. Not only do we understand the repetition of the routinized time schedules, we can zoom out until we're able to see the park overall. We're also able to get a sense that certain people are placed in positions of authority and that they have surveillance powers and control over the domain of the park. Seeing things in miniature makes it look less dangerous than when we're immersed inside of it. There's this great book by Susan Stewart that's called On Longing. Miniature worlds for her are metaphors for our own interiority, like one, one's own feelings and, and dialogue, like how we use dollhouses to play out internal emotional states. But I also want to revisit the idea of trains, because interestingly, the idea for Disneyland, probably the most important theme park there is, came to Walt Disney while he was on a trip to Chicago uh, to attend a railroading fair. And he put on a pair of engineers' overalls and pretended that he was operating a train. 
And this immersive game of pretend was so powerful to him that when he got home, he built a working miniature train world all the way around his house. And then trains show up in Disneyland as well. So it seems like trains and theme park and theme park imagination seem to go hand in hand. So we're finally seeing the architecture of the back of house production and staging grounds for the hosts. The architecture is composed of black horizontal planes as floors and ceilings. Their blackness makes it difficult to visually understand where they stop and start. Everything in the vertical direction is glass, which almost eliminates the visual disconnection between the inside and the outside of the rooms. The visual of this scene is made striking by the fact of the narrow distance, both literally and figuratively, between the inside of each room, which feels like it's part of the Westworld theme park, and the outside hallway, which is the domain of some other corporately controlled environment. This actually reminds me of the concept of heterotopia, as coined by the philosopher Michel Foucault. Most people have heard of utopias, which are mythical, usually ideal places that don't or can't exist. But heterotopias are places that do exist, but seem like separate, nested worlds. The example of a lot of people use to describe heterotopias are cruise ships, which are floating worlds in and of themselves. They're like a complete city, with their own laws and population that is severed from the rest of the world. And I think Westworld is all about this idea of heterotopias, and the dangers of when these worlds, which are meant to be separate, come too close together. If Susan comes into contact with this world, his worlds collide. <laughs> you know what happens then? The train is an important instrument in bringing worlds together at a certain scale. And when we see the office space like this, it's like a contamination of one world into the other. The way that human hosts are constructed seems like a clear reference of the Vitruvian Man, uh, a description of humans by the architect and theorist Vitruvius, where he tries to explain the geometric construction of the human form. I tell you, have fun, stay safe. Here we see William arriving at a corporate-styled environment to prepare for entering into the Westworld Park. Fittingly, it's a train station, but it also has really no qualities of its own. It's not like the grand stations of, say, New York or Paris or other metropolitan stations. This space is clearly very closely regulated and slick, where no one is able or encouraged to express their unique individuality. The only real area where unique spaces are presented in this space is the screen on the mezzanine, which plays advertisements for the parks. It's interesting because in the book Variations on a Theme Park, Michael Sorkin argues that today we're thinking about actual cities in real life as theme parks. And evidence of this is that our cities are behaving more like television. Like the cut between scenes in a video is similar to the way that cities are becoming more like simulations themselves that erase the unique qualities of differences between different zones and spaces in the city. And in real life, we have things right next to each other that don't really belong together, and anything goes with anything else. So not only can we talk about how Westworld is like other theme parks, like Disneyland, we can also talk about how it relates to our everyday lives, which is even more interesting. And architects like Charles Moore call Disneyland the most influential piece of post-war urbanism. Not because of its isolated success, but because it is a model for how we live and build cities ever since. This storyline will make Hieronymus Bosch look like he was doodling kittens. I just love the reference to Hieronymus Bosch, the Dutch painter whose garden of earthly delights is a super intense montage of scenes of people engaging in all sorts of depraved sensual activities. We could talk all day about what's going on in there. He saw something that wasn't there. I just love how the, the same cold black and glass building interior can stage a cozy office complete with historical relics and a wooden desk. They feel so out of place uh, that they're clearly props that are just there to make humans feel more at home or more at ease. All bets are down. Here we're seeing an early iteration of the back of house production spaces. 
The difference between the old and the new, I think, is really revealing. For instance, it's much heavier in construction with the CMU block, the heavy metal window frames, and the wire glass. And I think that the difference is both literal and symbolic of the fact that the West World inside of these rooms is further away from the reality that's within the hallway. The distance between these heterotopias, the inside and the outsides, aren't quite so close. The technology and the architecture can't quite achieve that a level of transparency. Disney World has tunnels running underneath the entire park for staff to travel hidden away from the tourists. But there are examples of pedestrian tunnels in our real-life cities like the Ponte Vecchio in Florence, which would allow the Medicis to flee the city unimpeded in case of attack. But we still have these in our cities today in places like Minnesota or even right here in Chicago in a zone that's called the Pedway. These passages allow people to go from building to building without stepping foot outside. It's like a surrogate street with two cities that operate independently and only touch each other at particular nodes. The problem comes in that these are streets for the public, but they're privately controlled spaces that feel more like shopping malls rather than the gritty reality of the city streets. At the end of the season, we finally find that host Maeve is appearing to set off for some adventure outside of the park. This is maybe a good time to mention how urban gentrification can sometimes co-opt the language of the Wild West. While probably not so prevalent anymore, when neighborhoods like the Lower East Side in New York began to become popular, even the liberal-leaning New York Times called it the taming of the Wild West. The trailblazers have done their work. West 42nd Street has been tamed, domesticated, and polished into the most exciting, freshest, and most energetic new neighborhood in all of New York. This is another disturbing way that Westworld parallels how we think about space that we live in in the real world. And now I want to offer some thoughts about how the show might engage architecture a little more thoughtfully. The first season is mostly about setting the world and building the atmospheres of Westworld. In later seasons, actual specific pieces of architecture are used to create more particular kinds of settings. I think this is like the way that the music is used in the show, where well-known songs are interpreted through the piano to be familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. So I think that the spaces of season one are pretty generic, and maybe not used as thoughtfully as, say, the music is yet, uh, but I think they do catch up later. And it's like the set designer wanting something office-y or Wild Westy. I think that the genericness is intentional, though, so this is more of an observation than a criticism. Because through these generic spaces, we're able to sense the unease of having complete worlds, which are meant to be separate, or heterotopias, but they come so close together that they start to collide. That's it for me. Please leave your thoughts on season one of Westworld in the comments below. If you stayed this long, please consider giving the video a like and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. See you later.